Okay, welcome. What makes a bad supervisor? Some of you will probably have seen the video that I did last year, I think it was last year, about um, what it takes to be a good supervisor, what a good supervisor is, that sort of thing. Um, so this follows on from that, and I'll reference that a couple of times. It's probably worth going and watching that video first, to be honest. But um, for those who are interested in getting an understanding of what I think about a bad supervisor is, this video is for you. So first off, we have to kind of think about... Um, this discussion doesn't get had often enough. Um, it, it gets had in a way in which it might be kind of individually, anecdotally framed. Um, my supervisor did this. Uh, just when I posted about the, doing this on Twitter, someone posted, uh, someone commented that their supervisor barely supervised them. And then when they finished their PhD, the, the supervisor expected to be first author on their on their published work you know these sort of horrible anecdotal stories we hear them but what we don't talk about is a kind of sustained analysis of 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 bad supervision and why there's so many stories of it um and i was thinking about this quite i think i think about this a lot because i don't want to be a bad supervisor i think about it from the times i think i might have done something which would fit me into the bracket of bad supervisor if i didn't concentrate or uh, I, I, I didn't provide the right advice. I think about this sort of stuff a lot. So this is, as usual with all my videos, a few thoughts, obviously wrong in certain areas, but usually onto something in others. So, so take that um, as the start point as always. So who's this video for? Well, you'd think, and, and this is what one of my PhD students said to me, you know, do you think that bad supervisors will watch this video? You know, who's it for? It's not for them, is it? Unfortunately, um, it should be. We should be able to grab bad supervisors and put them down in front of video and go watch this and start thinking about why you can be a better person. But they won't. One, they won't even consider the process of, of looking to be a better supervisor because they did. It probably wouldn't be a bad supervisor. And two, they're probably the sort of person who, even if they watch this video, wouldn't recognize that it's about them and some things that they do. So that's kind of pointing to a lack of reflection and a lack of knowledge of self, which I touch on in the in the first video about what a good supervisor is. So again, that kind of that 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 ability to reframe yourself, rethink about who you are, and really consider what that process looks like um, for you and for the other, the supervisee, the student, is really really important. So who is it for then if it's not for them? Well, it's probably for new supervisors and it's probably for people who are reasonable, right? I think most of us are just middle, right? <laughs> most of us aren't really bad. Most of us aren't really good at most things. We're in the middle. So we can always get a bit better. There's very few really, really bad supervisors. Of course, there are some and we can hear the horror stories, but most of us, we just do our best. And our best is sometimes good enough. Our best is sometimes not good enough. So it's actually aimed at most people. It's aimed at people like me who think they're pretty good in certain instances that, that have probably stuffed up in others and know that they can definitely do better. So if you're anything like that, this is for you. It's also for students as well. Students so that they can understand what might go into making a bad supervisor. Not so that they can go, look, you're a bad supervisor, but so they can look out for it and understand it in a more critical sense. Because, believe it or not, it's not all down to the supervisor as well. Um, there are other factors, structural factors that go on that lead to bad supervision. So I think it's for those sort of people, for people who want to be better at supervision, simply put, right, which should be most of us. Um, so another part of this, we need to think about what bad means. Now, I'm just going to use that term really loosely and not really define it, right? You can kind of put your own badness in. But broadly speaking, what I'm kind of getting at is someone who's not really supportive, doesn't understand the way to communicate properly and that it's on them, the supervisor, really to set the parameters of good communication. And if good communication isn't happening, right, you've got to do something about it. Um, a person who can't lift themselves out of their own worldview to see that it's the student's um, journey, the student's PhD project, you have to set them up on their journey and you have to try and not distract them from their journey distract them from their journey but encourage them on it um someone who's unorganized someone who's like all over the place that's some of my problems at times um someone who's a bit of an egomaniac if you follow me on twitter you know i always talk about academics as egomaniacs just so many so many are, are like fall into that trap and and if you're that person um 
as, as Eric Anderson once said to me, university um, staff, it's the revenge of the nerds. Bullied at school, bullied at university, but stayed on, got a PhD, and now it's payback time. So those sort of academics, they don't make good PhD supervisors as, as far as I can see it. But again, they're kind of few and far between, although most people have some elements of that in them. One thing to be careful of, and this is something that PhD students really, really fall into in the, as a trap, is associating good and bad with something like friendly, approachable, good, or grumpy, mean, bad. And, and it's too simplistic. And, it, and it's, it's framing the relationship in a way that doesn't need to be framed because grumpy supervisors can be fantastic and friendly supervisors can be terrible. It's something that I'm quite careful of with the students that I get on well with, that I, I force myself to be able to still say the things that you've got to say to someone that you get on well with, right? It's the same as any good relationship that gets close. The closer you are, the harder it is to sometimes tell somebody the truth and because you know you're going to hurt them. Conversely, you don't get on with them. It can be too easy to tell them the truth all the time and to not be as compassionate, as caring you need to be. And the reality is that all supervision relationships are long term. Oh, sorry, all effective relationships because they've, they've got to be uh, somewhat effective to be able to last the course of a PhD. So all somewhat effective PhD students, PhD relationships are long term relationships. There's elements of caring within them. There's elements of of um, challenge and disalignment and moments of communication good communication and bad communication, all the sort of things that actually you have in your close friendship relationships, your family relationships, your romantic relationships, all of the same problems and twists and turns and ups and downs. It, there's variations of them within PhD programs, within PhD relationships. And to, to think that that process should be linear and flat and always good or always super professional. Um, well, actually, no, that's fine. It can always be super professional. Um, but always the same is daft because th that's not how relationships exist. So there's this up and down process. And sometimes you'll like each other. Sometimes you won't. And for the supervisor, your job is to be able to move past that, th those moments where it's not going as well and to work through it and, and to lead that relationship maybe more than you would in other relationships where there's that kind of closeness to it. All right. Slightly getting off track there. So let's start talking about what? a bad supervisor what might, might make a bad supervisor we've tried to highlight what one kind of could be but what makes it well first off one of the biggest problems and if you've ever heard, heard me talk about this anywhere or you you've seen me on twitter i've mentioned this i mentioned it in the, in the first volume of the book i think as well is that a phd is, is now a necessary it didn't used to be a necessary but it's now a necessary um qualification a necessary element of being a supervisor in my institution, you can't supervise, sorry, in my department, you can't supervise PhDs without a PhD. But it's also an, um, it's a necessary but insufficient qualification, right? The, the process of getting a PhD does not prepare you to supervise someone else to get a PhD. Now, it might. There's potentials for that. You might have some skills from different areas. You might have some kind of... Um, innate skills around compassion and caring and communication or whatever that really set you up for that. But the PhD doesn't necessarily. In fact, I go further than that, that the skills of a PhD, and let's go further, you know, a, a middle career researcher, someone who's advanced, and especially someone who's in a prof professorial role, those skills, the drive, the focus, the sometimes the ego, um, they're, they're, they're great skills, but they're not the skills of a mentor, of a supervisor, of a, of a person who leads via guided discovery, of a necessarily a skilled communicator, of someone who's got compassion. They're not necessarily the same skills. They may even be the opposite skills. You may find that there's people that you work with who are at the top of their profession in academia that are just terrible supervision, supervisors. Of course, they've got all the knowledge. Of course, they've got the setup with the lab and all the money and they can do all of that but they're not necessarily the best supervisor in really important ways. So we have to remember that. One of the reasons why people aren't good supervisors, we don't get trained. We, we, we simply don't get trained during the process as, a, as, a, as an automatic element of what we're doing. And really, the, the, we have to go further with that because this, the supervisor of your supervisor is linked into that. I want to make sure that when my students finish, 
they have the ability to think about what that process was. They understand what PhD ness is. They understand what it takes and the the broad structures that we've been working within. But actually, some supervisors don't provide that. They say, do this, do that, the other. Keep repeating. Keep following my instructions. Get to the end, and you'll probably do fine. Write this up like I did, and that kind of copy and paste idea doesn't really work. Because the next time that you're then, when you're then the supervisor, all you can do is copy and paste your supervisor's work onto your students, your supervisor's model onto your students. And, and that and that doesn't really work in the way that perhaps it once did, but it certainly doesn't work now in the world that we're living in um, with the students that we work with now. Add on to that, that supervision training is terrible. I, I've done a couple of bits of supervision training and there were, there were, they were diabolical. Um, the, the, the one that we had to do was literally a tick box exercise, which is horrific. It was a, I remember it was a slide, um, one, one or two slides of, of PowerPoint with like a million bullet points on it. I shouldn't say a million, 10, because there was actually 10 with two, <laughs> two lines on each on one slide. It was ridiculous. Um, and it was like, right, you've attended this, go away, go supervise to your heart's content. Now, the other one I attended, it was more around mentoring. And that was quite useful. Now, I've attended the mentoring one, and that's framed slightly differently, but that's voluntary. That's the one that we've got to do. The, the tick box one, just go and read a manual for that. Anyway, so the, the university um, training for, for supervisors, at least the stuff that I've experienced, UK context, is, is pretty terrible. Um I'm sure there's other examples, but that's something that we have to be aware of. So the, the PhD doesn't train us for it. Um, life might not train it for us. It might, academic life might not train it, train it in us. And then the university doesn't require us to do any really good training either. So we've got this kind of like structural start point, which isn't great. Um, so within that, we also have to add in that there are people who are arseholes. Right. Let's not let's not forget that. Now, there's probably reasons why people are assholes. I've been an arsehole in the past and in the past, and there's probably been decent reasons for it. But we can't just like consistently look at all of these structures and these kind of cultures of academia and all that and like say that that's the reason. There's people who are knobheads. And if your supervisors are knobhead, they're going to have to do, a, especially if they don't realise it, um, they're going to have to a lot of work to unpick that knobheadness by the time that they're supervising because they've probably been like that for a while. So we do have to be careful of that. And, and if we think that, if we fool ourselves into thinking that academics are all nice um, or even um, considered, <laughs> we've been setting ourselves up for a fall. One of the starkest moments of my life was when I realised the two starkest moments of my life, which we all have to go through. One, recognising that your parents are fallible, right? It happens to us, some earlier than others. And then two, recognising that academics are normal people with all of the bullshit problems that normal people have. And some of them are egomaniacs and not very nice. That's a reality. Most are pretty good. Now, the problem that comes for students. Now, for me, with the colleagues that I think are like that, that are a bit crab, whatever, I just don't just don't knock about with them. And then when I see them, you know, professional emails and that's it, you have to, you have to speak to these people. But if you end up being supervised by someone like that, you've got to know what to do. And you've got to be able to see it and you've got to be able to manage it. And that's where the doctoral school comes in. That's where the supervision is happening as a team so that you can speak to the, the, the colleagues within it. Um, and you have to be able to speak up. Um, we all know that no supervisor is perfect. We all ho hopefully recognise that we will at some point have a, a, a relationship with a student for, for whatever reasons that doesn't work. And we don't. We try not to take it to heart, and you've got to be able to talk about that. So, if you're a student watching, please make sure that you you you're active in that, and don't sit with a what you think is a bad supervisor and just accept it. There's there's more to be done than that, and there's people to speak to within your institution. All right. So, <clears throat> within that, I've kind of hinted to this a couple of times. The other the other skill which makes somebody a bad supervisor, sorry, the lack of skill which makes someone a bad supervisor is the inability to see themselves as a supervisor and what that means. Um, in the video, I talk about what, what makes a good supervisor. I talk about that as accepting your role as a mentor. And a mentor moves themselves into the background, right? This process is not about my, my PhD students. The process is not about my development, my academic or personal development. Now, I have personally and academically improved or developed in various ways because of my 
process of supervision because of my PhD students work. Of course I have, but that's not the point. That was a byproduct. This is something that I think isn't caught by many, or maybe even most people is that a PhD student isn't about your career the supervisor's career. A lot of people fall into that trap. Oh, I must get more PhD students because I want to do these things. That's the wrong way to approach it. Those things might happen. You may get some real good positives that come out of that personally for you, your career, and even becoming a better person like I have since I've been supervising. But um, it's got to be a byproduct and they may not happen as well and you have to be prepared for that. Okay, so again, that's that video about what makes a good supervisor. So please go and look at that. But there's more to it. There's more to this stuff as well. And this is where we start to take a little bit of the blame off supervisors. And we don't just focus on this kind of anecdotal, my supervisor was a knobhead, but we actually have a little bit of compassion towards supervisors. So firstly, um, the changing world of academia means that the, the way in which I learned is not the way in which my students will learn. My supervisor's development did not prepare him to prepare me for the career that I'm creating. Right? That, that, that everything's changing too quickly. The world is changing too quickly. The advice that you can get from a kind of old seasoned prof is often good, but also deficient in various ways. They'll tell you something like, um, get some papers in, in these publications, bring some funding in, go. And the reality is that isn't enough to get you a job necessarily or to get you promoted or whatever. Or the reality is you don't want to work in those areas. You know, you want to work outside of academia, which I think we're getting to the point where most PhD students do now. Most PhD students won't stay in academia. Those profs, their background does not help in the future, right? My background doesn't help my students in various ways. I am deficient in my knowledge. And as long as I'm aware of that and they're aware of that, we can do something with that. But it's when I don't become aware of that and I just start spouting, well, this worked for me, therefore it's going to work for you. So I think that's something to, 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 to really be aware of. Um, the, the pressures of the situation that many academics find themselves in are extreme. Now, I'm lucky enough that I've carved out a career where I'm not going for promotion. I'm, I'm not overly burdened with um, trying to change the world or, or whatever. Um, I'm happy with what I've got and I'm happy doing my small thing in a really controlled and organised way. Pfft, sorted. It means I've got a lot of time to think about this sort of stuff. I'm quite lucky in that regard. Many people aren't. Many people do desperately want to get promotion do desperately want to impress people, do desperately want to stay ahead of other people. And that leads to anxiety and issues within their own way of understanding the world, which gives them less time to be a good supervisor. Now, there are people who are high flyers, who smash it every day, who are great supervisors. Okay, There's, there's no one-for-one -one relationship with any of this sort of stuff. But we certainly have to be aware of the pressures that supervisors are under. And I think most students get that. Most students get that there's certain times where it's like, okay, you might not hear from your supervisor for a little bit because they're marking. I know when I go into a marking deadline, 120 essays in two weeks turn around all on my own. It's fine. It's my job. I like doing it. But I ain't going to be supervising you that week or those two weeks. We're going to have to have a bit of a break unless it's desperate. Most students get that. But I think that sort of changing world of academia, the high pressure nature of it, um, really has to be understood as to why bad supervision may happen. And then we also have the power dynamics of the situation. And I kind of hinted at this, and it's only in the, in the wrong hands that this, this is really bad, but in every situation, the power dynamic is set with a hierarchy. The supervisor, um, however much we try and frame it as the, the supervisee's process, journey, project, etc., the supervisor knows stuff right they've been doing this before they 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 are looked at for advice now that's usually fine right that's that's usually not an issue at all um it's usually good right i know stuff so i can impart some knowledge and i've been through things so i can help advise but in the wrong hands that's why really bad supervision can happen um no different to these issues with sports coaches and priests and the horrific things that have happened in those places, those spaces, sexual abuse happens. But if we just draw back from those sort of horrific, horrific cases and just have bad sports coaches, 
and bad priests who say mean shit to people and and scare kids and and do stuff that they shouldn't do because they're allowed to because of the power dynamic. So for us as, as as supervisors, we have to be aware of that, subvert it where we can. We have to hold on to it because in the end, we're, we're the ones who have to guide this process. We're the net that catches things when things go wrong. We're the person who has to say that was wrong, you need to do it this way. In the end, we, we have to have that element of power, but we can subvert it as much as possible. We can certainly make sure that we don't um, abuse it in any sort of even mild ways. So that's something to be aware of. Um, I've talked about the skills of a prof, haven't I? Yeah, okay, the skills of a prof don't match the skills of a supervisor. So I guess that's it, really. So I've, what I've tried to do there is I've tried to kind of walk around some of these issues, put some blame on people for being crap, yeah, but also highlight that the blame can't just be leveled at individuals and anecdotal data is anecdotal data. We need to look at the situations that profs find themselves in, supervisors find themselves in, and all the pressures that come with that. So what, what's what's to do? Well, first off, we need to recognise as, as supervisors and people being supervised that we're not perfect, that there's times when we need to be better, there's times that we need to work harder at it, whatever that is for you. But that requires assessment, that requires consideration, that requires a self-audit, which I think a lot of people don't do because it's too fucking busy. So we do need to do that self-audit. All right, how did that meeting go? She, she seemed to switch off. Why was that? Okay. What can I have said better there? Oh, did I jump in and not let her finish? What was this issue? Why did I say that to him in that way? And think through these ideas a little bit more. Record some of them so you can look back. Ask your colleagues for feedback about how you're doing in your supervision meetings. Have people in there who are more senior than you. The thing that I, I did with my first student is to make sure I had two very senior people to, to, to watch me supervise and to supervise me supervising and now with uh future future students and other students that followed on from that the teams that i build don't necessarily require that those profs anymore but they require people i know i'll listen to and i know will call me out and i know that we'll be able to take a different view to me so that that sort of tension i look for that tension in the process chris come on you you're not doing that right is what I want to hear when I'm not doing it right I run towards that I've had to run towards it because I'm not right I make a lot of mistakes I'm a very fallible human being so I run towards being better as any opportunities I can I can't be scared of that you've got to run towards it and I guess I, the, the, the watch the video on to how to be a good student but what makes a good supervisor of course that's that's where the answers for this are but the main one there is a shift I've already talked about the shift to self-reflection and looking at yourself but it's the biggest shift is, is how can I be the best supervisor I can be? Not how can I be the best husband or dog owner? I'm using my own personal examples here or um, researcher or boxer once upon a time or tattoo enthusiast, whatever. Not how can I be the best of them? How can I be the best supervisor? The energy that you put into being the best of the thing that you want to be, the best dad, the best mum, that energy, maybe not all of it, but it needs to be directed into being the best supervisor you can be. I think if you do that and you have reflection, you can't really go wrong. There's resources out there. Of course there are, but resources are nothing without the motivation, the, the mattering, that stuff mattering. And if you're not, if it doesn't matter to you that you're a good supervisor and you really set your supervisees up, then that process of looking at resources is a complete waste of time. All right. So what makes a bad supervisor? I hope that's helped a bit. As always, any questions, and get in touch if anyone wants to talk about their journey of becoming a supervisor with me and and get some of my personal experiences or personal takes drop me a dm i'm always happy to talk about this stuff um and there's loads of stuff about this in the member site as well um at present it's still only two pounds a month dead cheap just to help me keep it with running costs and these sort of thoughts that i talk about here um i go into in more detail in that sort of space it's a it's a bit of a it's a good space for me to kind of get through all this sort of stuff in various ways all right. Hope that's useful. Check out the other video on how to be a good supervisor. There'll be links below and all that sort of stuff.